All right, my friends, welcome back for another interview. Uh, this is Troy Miller with F64 Live and IEPPV. And with me today, we have my wonderful daughter, Kira Miller. And we are going to be talking today about why design matters. Kira, thank you for filling the slot. Thank you for coming <laughs> on, even though you're just, you know, a, a, a throw down the hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I know a lot about what you do. I know about, you know, some of the things that, that you're into and where your skill set lies. But why don't you go ahead and tell everybody uh, a little bit about Kira? Sure. So um, I have a just sort of from a curriculum standpoint, um, I went to college for graphic design and marketing. Um, I also learned a little bit about web design in the process and just have been doing freelance design work um, for as long as I've been able to know Photoshop. Um, so I've worked in design in terms of graphic design and logos to social media marketing to email marketing um, and even into print production in the last couple of years. So I've had my hands in a lot of different pieces of design and industries um, and it's a uh, it's a really fun career to be in. So, and I, I get to work with a lot of really cool people and, you know, different industries all the time. So. Right. So one of the things that you do on a regular basis is you manage, tell us, tell us what your involvement is with the Garfers Journal and the Surfers Journal. Cause I know that you're very involved with those. Sure. So the Surfers and Golfers Journals are um, two publications that are really close to my heart. Um, I help their team run the production end of both magazines. So I work really closely with their, um, their project manager, with their designer and art directors and such, um, photo editors. And essentially, I help them create a schedule for the publication. I review color proofs to make sure um, that when the proofs come in, that the printing actually matches you know, what the client is gonna uh, expect. I'm essentially the last hands on everything having to do um, with the magazine before it's printed. So I also do a lot of communications overseas to make sure that it's printed and the right amounts are printed and, um, you know, that everything's inserted in the right place. But it's, it's a really cool part of design that I didn't know was a job before I started doing it. Um, and now it's one of my favorite projects that I work on. It's, it's really fun. Right. Very cool. Yeah, I see. I see Peter, uh, who is uh, <laughs> ICLA, is the company that you work for that does the Surfers and Corpus Journal. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter, Peter is ICLA. So yeah, yep. and Peter asks <laughs> in the Q&A because he knows, he says, so how did you get all that wonderful worldwide design experience? You must <laughs> have a wonderful boss. Taught me everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Perfect. All right. So, um, let me get right back here on track. So with the idea of this program, you know, you and I always talk a lot about why design matters. And a lot of times, you know, we will find ourselves out in the world or watching a TV show or looking at a, at a project or whatever. And we're like, Oh my God, who needs to use five fonts? You know, <laughs> why, why is the, is the kerning, right? They get that right? Uh -huh, why, yeah. <laughs> kerning, you know, so, so tell us a little bit about how design fits into your world and how, when you look at the world, you see design. Sure. Um, you know, it's funny, even if you're not a designer, you're influenced by design literally all the time. And I'm not just talking like the businesses who's, social media posts you see, I'm talking about the chair you sit in. Um, when I was in college, I had a professor tell me that, you know, and, and I, I've kind of struggled with this question as I've sort of gotten older is, if you're a true designer, you can design anything. Is it, is it gonna be good? Who knows? But um, I say that because, you know, design's all around you. So for me specifically, and I know I've, you know, kind of imparted this on you and mom, is that, um, you know, when it comes to graphic design specifically, graphic design is meant for someone else. It's not meant for the designer. Um, so for a great example are like billboards. 
Um, I can't tell you how many billboards I've seen on my commute where, you know, the type is, the text is just so small that even when I get up right close to it, I can't read it. And to me, that's a bad design. Um, so, you know, I, I see fonts all the time. You know, I, I'm seeing colors and contrasts all the time. And another big part of design that I've sort of been learning along the way um, is usability and accessibility you know, especially with like digital design content. Um, so it affects me in a lot of ways, just sort of knowing about it, but everybody's affected by it, you know, whether or not um, you're sort of attuned to that. Now, when, when you mentioned design, and I know you and I watch a lot of the same podcasts, but design, and I, and I was really surprised to hear this, that, that design um, has such an integral impact in our lives every day from, uh, and I, and I will get away from the branding and the print design a little bit. We'll talk about just the physical world, but just how high a doorknob is off the, off the ground or the size of the doorknob or how seat belts are designed or mm -hmm. chairs. Uh, and in, in one of these programs that you and I watched, we've, we've come to realize that so much of this design has been based on the, the male physique or the male size, right? The average, mm -hmm. um, and so as a young woman going out into the world today, when you look at whether it's print design or it's physical design, do you see those things uh, uh, impact you or do you like recognize like, oh, this wasn't <laughs> exactly designed for me and I'm going to go change that someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the podcast for the show that you're referring to specifically, learning that like cars were not made for women and the size of women and the leg lengths of women was really surprising to me. And I, so that, that stuff I didn't know. And that's stuff that really shocked me. So as far as like everyday things like cars and doors and stuff, um, I'm sure I'm affected by them, but because they've been the same for as long as I've known, um, that's new stuff that I'm discovering. Um, and so it is kind of exciting to sort of listen to other designers that are in those fields when it comes to products um, and user design and, and product design. Um, those people are sort of solving the problems that me and print design and graphic design can't solve um, right away. So that kind of stuff I don't quite see all the time, but I'm definitely keeping my eye out more often um, now that I kind of know about it and just you know, our, our world and our community was designed by somebody else at some time, whether it was a man or a woman, like the way, you know, that you use a faucet was designed by somebody. Um, the way you turn a doorknob was designed some, by somebody. Right. right. Um, my, in, my water bottle, <laughs> the, the, uh, but right. I mean, like just even, just even the physical diameter, they had to, somebody had to sit down and consider uh, who is this going to best fit on average? Right. And, and that was, that was surprising to me and not surprising in the information, but just surprising in sort of the opening of Pandora's box to be like, oh my gosh, like it is a much more, um, illuminating type concept. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, if you could change one design thing today, if you could just snap your fingers and say that, that design thing would, would go away, whether it's in print uh, maybe it's a bad logo somebody has, or it's a physical design element in the world. Uh, and you don't have to answer it right away. <laughs> okay, good, because I don't have an answer right away. That's such a loaded question. Oh, good, good. Well, I, have good to, I have to mull over it. <laughs> well, good thing is the community has some questions for you. So Stephen Sharp says, Kira, and I'm assuming it says, would you say that good design should drive or enable the function of the content design embodiment, whether it be a billboard or a bicycle? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say good design definitely drives everything. Um, I mean, you could have a, an amazing catchphrase for your billboard, but if you don't have a good design to sort of implement that catchphrase or that piece of marketing, it's gonna fall. Um, and unfortunately, I see that all the time. Um, you know, you've got a, you've got a campaign that's just has really good heart and messaging to it. And I get lost on, you know, the webpage or the print ad because the text is too small or there's too much of it. Um, yeah, so definitely good design is, is going to drive every piece of any project. What, what would be a definition 
of branding because because design and branding are sometimes synonymous with one another as as we talk and we converse. Um, how would you how would you see those two and how are they how are they the same and how are they different? How do we play on those? Yeah, so there are a lot of opinions on what branding is and what graphic design is, um, just like there are about like what is fine art. Um, but you know, when it comes to branding, the way that I see it is design is sort of the vehicle for branding to be successful, you know, so different components of branding can be sort of like an origin story or, you know, just, uh, let's talk about like a, a background of a business, let's say, well, that's a really good brand idea, but until you can get some visuals behind it. Um, and actually get it into the world through design, whether that be environmental or digital or print, um, no one's going to know about it or you're not going to tell the right people about it. So in short, design for me is the vehicle for branding. Um, now, I found a really good quote. Um, it's by Marty Neumeyer. He is an author that does, a, he has a history in brand design. He does a lot of books on brand design. And I think he just puts it really concisely. Um, he says, a brand is not a logo, an identity, or a product. Uh, a brand is a person's gut feeling on a product, service, or organization. Keyword being, it's somebody's gut feeling. Um, you know, I think oftentimes people use the term logo and branding synonymously. And I think in some cases, you know, that gray area is acceptable, but you know, when you're talking about really building an impactful brand, that, that logo is just part of that brand. So branding is sort of the umbrella for all the components that have to do with your business. That's your website, that's your logo, that's your marketing materials. So, but there, there's a lot of conversation out in the world about what branding is, but that's just sort of my, <laughs> that's my yeah, vision. No, it's, it's it's interesting and and you know you and I are working on F64 live and you know I kind of see the brand as the voice I want somebody to be able to look at a logo look at a page look at the color scheme look at the the wording in the text the cadence the attitude to me that feels like a brand is that would that would that be called a brand yeah um for sure i i think you know, I think everybody's going to digest a brand a little bit differently and they're all going to take something different away. So like what you're describing is, is really consistent messaging that matches sort of the tone that you get, you know, like, like Apple's messaging and their content and what they're writing matches the way that you feel when you walk into their store. Right. So, you know, it's sort of that, that feeling, that sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's all part of it. Got it. We have a couple questions, so let's let's hit those before we go on because I think they're pertinent to the next step. Um, Nick is asking, how and where do you draw the line between poor design and difference in taste? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it comes down to usability, honestly. L like I said, you are when when you're a designer. So when I say you, I'm really speaking for myself and people who are doing design. When designers are making something, they're not making it for themselves. So I I have you know, a ton of clients whose work I've done that is not my taste, um, but it is something they're happy with. And at the end of the day, if it speaks to the right target market and it's doing its job, um, then to me, that's good design. I'm not going to agree with every color scheme that every brand uses. Like at the end of the day, that's just public opinion. Um, but you know, if I design a flyer that isn't really my taste, but it gets you know, the date and the time and, you know, all the important stuff across, um, that's good design to me. So it really doesn't have a lot to do with aesthetics at the end of the day. Yes. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, like, but before you and I actually started recording, we were going through uh, a website, a really cool, a really cool website actually. And what it basically was, it was called, um, it's called brand new. And I'll bring it up here just for just for a quick second. I don't want to get too distracted with this, but basically these these are about companies that do rebranding, and the the public gets to sort of speak to it, right? Yeah, there. I don't know the name of of the author or if there are many authors, but essentially there is a particular author that will write an opinion piece um, on the rebrand, and then there is a public forum at the bottom where you can sort of rate what you think about the logo and the mark and the messaging. 
Um, and like you and I were talking, like it, it can get kind of brutal. I mean, everybody has an opinion <laughs> there's, on there's, something. Yeah. There's a lot of comments down here, which I, I find this to be, to be really great. It's actually under a uh, new construction under construction.com is the, is the name of the website. And it's really great because if anybody's looking at building a brand, cause we're going to get into the, to the idea of branding and business and why that matters so much. But if you're thinking about building a brand, this is a really good place to do some research to see like, Oh, look, FedEx changed their logo. I think it's, I think it's kind of cruddy. What does the rest of the world think about that? Um, and, and we'll, we'll get into, <laughs> we'll get into the business. Um, we've got some, we got some more questions pouring in that I, I think are very topical. So, Unless you have any comment on that whole rebranding of FedEx. No, no, I could go on and on all day, but no. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, so Frederick Fran Johnson's in the house. Thank you for coming, Frederick. Uh, Frederick okay. asks, what's more important, copywriting or design? Oh, well, I'm a little biased because <laughs> I'm on the design <laughs> side. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm probably honestly going to have to go with the design because design is the vehicle for the copywriting. I mean, unless literally somebody is reading the copywriting from a Word document, um, if I put it on a website or if I put it on a postcard and I make it, you know, eight point, which is like my tiny, um, you can't read it. And the other part of that too is, you know, something I work with clients a lot on is, I'll have a website project and they'll come to me and they'll give me a word document with great copywriting um, for their about page. And it's two pages long. Like no one's going to read it no matter how great the third paragraph is. Um, so there's a lot of like disseminating of, you know, how many sentences is easy to read, how much space do you use, how much letting and between paragraphs and that kind of thing. So I'm going to have to go with design on that. <laughs> I was, uh, uh, Frederick has another question and basically it was just, how do you, how do designers and brands know when to change or update a brand? Like when Kentucky fried chicken made the change to KFC. And I was trying to, I was trying to actually find that on that website to see, but I, I can't, I can't <laughs> quite find that. So how does a company know when to do that? How do you know when your brand is old and when it's good, or maybe it's just time to update or. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, every company is going to be different, but specifically in the, the KFC rebrand, again, th this is not something that I've researched, so I'm just making assumptions. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know one person that's ever referred to KFC as Kentucky Fried Chicken. So mm -hmm. at, at one point, you know, their team, um, their PR team, their design team, their corporate team, recognized that that was what they were being referred to as and i think by changing the name or by moving over to you know that acronym um they're reaching an audience that you know wants to recognize them in a specific way um so i think at that point like specifically for that like i think that was a really good marketing move because if they continued to call themselves that and brand themselves as that they're disconnected from their audience because no one's calling them their full name um, I, I, I think in other cases, it's, it's a modernizing, it's, it, there's a lot of factors that go into it. I can, I can think back far enough to when we called it Kentucky Fried Chicken, we didn't call it KFC. So somewhere along wow. the lines, either, either they caught on to the public thinking, you know, using that acronym and maybe they decided to change with it or they changed it and we just sort of went along like lemmings. We didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is totally valid too. I mean, take companies like Apple that are, you know, while they may take public opinion, like they've kind of been known to do things that the public doesn't know they need or isn't expecting. And I think you can make those moves when you have a strong brand. And, and even if you're not a big brand, if you can execute it well, um, I, I think that sort of move without the public can be successful. Right. You want to, you want to change sort of the brand focus. Like Steven says in the questions, the reason they rebranded away from Kentucky fried chicken was for health considerations around fried food. So they wanted to probably take mm -hmm. the fried out of there, which is, which is really good. And Peter says FedEx was federal express in the stone age. Yes. Nice. <laughs> yes, it was. Nice. yes, it was. Yeah. Um, I mean, branding by itself like 
Kentucky Fried Chicken taking out the fried, like that's them controlling their voice right. and them controlling their brand voice. And, you know, sometimes that's how brands are really powerful. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's sort of that subconscious level too, right? Cause there's, there's such things as uh, psychographics and evidence-based design where colors and shapes have a subconscious effect on us. And those are some things that you consider as a designer. I would, I would think that when you're looking at designing something for a hospital uh, you may consider certain colors, or if you're designing something for say the golfer's journal versus the surfer's journal, there's a, there's a color palette there that one audience would be more apt to, you know, be drawn to. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. I'm just guessing. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I haven't spent a lot of time sort of in the psychographics um, area. That is, that is an expert field all on its own. I mean, evidence-based design is an expert field, um, but it, it certainly does play a part. Um, I mean, most chains of fast food restaurants use yellow and red. And I don't have the research in front of me to tell you why, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess. I'm just going to guess. And I think it's French fries and ketchup. That's what I think it is. Oh, well, you know, that's valid. That's brands are up for public opinion. It's whatever you want it to be. You, you still eat there. So <laughs> <laughs> I would love to go have ketchup and, and <laughs> French fries. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That was a soft spot. <laughs> I know. I know. <sighs> COVID sigh. Um, so why with, with all this kind of conversation around brand and design and stuff, why, why does brand matter to a business? Why, why does that brand matter? So, and let me ask this in another way, somebody who's starting a business now, or maybe, you know, thinking about, I haven't done this in a long time or I'm going to start my photography business or my pool cleaning business, whatever. Mm-hmm. Why does, why does having a brand factor into their business, uh, you know, over outline? Yeah. Um, a, a brand just sort of in the definitions we've given and sort of the stories we've talked about, we can talk about Apple's brand because we know about it. And because, you know, for you and I, it's something that we relate to. It's a community that we relate to. Um, so brands are a really strong vehicle for connecting not even just your clients, but a wider audience with what it is that you're actually selling, whether it be a product or a service. Um, It, it, in some cases can help delineate you from or or separate you from um, your competition. Um, It can be used to sort of tell your story to help people relate to that. Um, and then brands overall are sort of the roadmap for, in my opinion, in the way that I sort of define it, brands are a roadmap to everything else you're going to do. So I'm very much a, you know, I like to have steps one through 10, like planned out, ready to go. And I can't do that unless I know sort of what my goal is or what my purpose is. And so a brand is really defining that purpose behind why you have a business. Why are you selling that product? Why are you, you know, what's special about you? What makes you different? Um, And not all brands, not all companies use brands to show how they're different or to show why they're special. But, you know, I can, I know a couple of brands that I, you know, their shorts look the same as these people's shorts, but I like their brand better and I relate to it better. (laughs) And their marketing, like I relate to their communications better. And that's all, that's all part of branding. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very true. We do, we do have companies that we like, I think sometimes just because of how they're branded and how their voice is and, and how they react, you know, without their product. Um, <clears throat> I have a, I have a couple graphics uh, that I found that I thought would be interesting to look at, you know, images, an image like this, where on the left half of the screen, you know, we might see uh, brands that aren't necessarily expensive where mm-hmm. on the right half of the screen, we see brands logos these are really their logos right yeah. uh things that are more expensive so could could you speak a little bit to you know why uh, why would jaguar use like all silver and shiny and m&ms is you know just brown and red yeah um i mean that kind of goes into just the psychology of people and the feelings that you want people 
to feel when they look at your brand. So, I mean, I, I have never been in a Jaguar dealership before, <laughs> but I'm, I'm almost guessing that the experience um, is, is going to sort of meet your expectation somewhere just in your recognition, the way that you recognize the brand when you actually interact with it in person or through a purchase, um, that experience should meet you at your expectation of the brand. So with Jaguar using, um, you know, like silver and very like monotone and very slick lines, like they're, they're trying to communicate that they, you know, what sort of the style that their cars are or the type of people that they're trying to um, sort of engage with their product. You know, like I said before, like people relate to brands because people want to feel um, part of a community. They want to feel understood. That's just part of the human condition. Um, so I think, you know, Jaguar, Apple, again, like those kinds of brands are really speaking to the audience that they want. Um, and then you've got brands like M&M and McDonald's and like they're using these, these bold colors and these bold graphics because they're maybe not talking to the to the Jaguar people. I mean, those are totally different industries, but kind of get what I mean. Yeah. Um, you know, they're hitting a, a different age demographic altogether. Um, they want something that's eye catching. They want something that's loud. So it's a lot, I, I would say 90% of the branding is understanding who you want your market to be because you're trying to relate to them through the brand itself. So when you're building your brand, we were just, you know, I just put up an image of, of some of the brands that, you know, exist in the world today. And I think that, you know, when you walk into, say, uh, a food court, for example, um, you, you sort of have this expectation of the brands. And if they're too fancy, we might stop and think like, oh, I, don't, I don't know, that looks expensive, right? Because brands can, can do that. You know, you go to... Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was going to say claim jumper, but uh, we don't have a claim jumper anymore. It's <laughs> claim now, jumper who? It, yeah, it's a lazy dog. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it was branded in a way that made us think about quality. So when it comes to our business, like, I guess the original question is, is like, how does that, how does that, why is branding important to our business? Is it, it conveys that voice, right? It helps people understand who we are, um, hopefully right off the bat by, by looking at that. Um, mm -hmm. Frederick, let's, let's hit a couple questions. Uh, Frederick is asking, do you as a designer, turn down jobs that clash with your personal beliefs or your politics? You know, I thankfully have never been in a position where I've had to do that. Um, the, the people that I work with, you know, their, their brands and the things that they're communicating have all, nothing has strayed away from sort of my, um, my belief system. Now that is a question that I was, you know, asked to think about when I was in school. I went to a private Christian university and studied in their design program. So, you know, it was biased towards a religion and that question came up. Um, and I, I would say that, yes, I would turn down work that, that sort of strayed from that, but it's, it's a really fine line. I mean, like, I would like to consider myself somebody that's open to other ideas, that's open to other belief systems, that's open to other lifestyles. Um, and so I don't necessarily want to, you know, in a scenario case, want to say like, well, just because I don't believe in your lifestyle means I'm not going to do your brand. Right, but um, if is, is is hateful or just so contrary in that it's that, that you feel it's going to do more harm than good. I mean, that's, that's just, Oh, being a good human, right? Like I'm, I'm not going to perpetuate that voice. That's not a voice I want to perpetuate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if it's, if the, if the design itself is something that is harmful to another group of people or just a harmful message that causes, you know, danger to somebody else or is advocating for things that are dangerous. Um, yeah. Those are brands that, that I won't work with. Um, again, I've never been put in that scenario and I know, I know that a lot of designers when it comes to freelance work have to make hard decisions because there's like the money side and then there's, you know, my, my conscience side. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, long story short, um, no, I, I wouldn't work with a brand that, that uses harmful messaging or, or branding and that sort of thing. Thankfully I haven't encountered that yet. So, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Peter's asking, why did you pick F64 and the design for the brand? So I picked so, it. <laughs> you designed it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I can answer half of that. So F64 uh, was inspired by Ansel Adams had a F64 group but way back in the day. And it was basically just the, these group of local photographers or photographers that he considered to be part of him, that they drove each other and really motivated each other. And I just always was... I always thought that was really cool. I just thought that was really neat. So sort of an homage to um, a mentor that I never got to meet was Ansel. <laughs> and then of course I created that. And then I went to Kira and I went, here's the name. And <laughs> this is a good, this is actually a really good segue that I didn't plan. But when you get it, somebody comes to you like, like dad or, or anybody says, Hey, I've got this, this company of 64 live. And how do you how do you design that? Why did you pick what you did and how do you do that? Yeah, so I'm sure you remember a lot of questions were involved <laughs> when <laughs> when you needed when you needed the logo. And thankfully I was privy to a lot of sort of that initial discussion. But just in, generally speaking, when somebody comes to me and says, Hey, I need a logo, I've got a million questions to ask you. Not just about like the colors you like, but the people you want to communicate to. Because like we talked about, there's a lot of relational stuff that happens with brands. Um, so, you know, when it comes to, um, oh, do you, yeah, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to, while you're, while you're talking, the, the, this is her sort of onboarding form that she sends. And she made me fill this out, by the way. Like dad yeah, had filled this out. So uh, there's a lot of really good questions in here. And I did put a link to this in the chat. Uh, this will also go in the show notes, but anyway, go, go ahead, Kira. So these. <laughs> yeah. So th those are some of the questions that I typically ask. And in the specific case of F64 Live, um, you know, it's a, it's a photography thing. And the last thing I wanted to do was put a camera in the logo that that's kind of where I started. <laughs> um, I didn't want to use icons that were, overly familiar. I mean, I'm saturated just in the photography world by, you know, by osmosis. Um, <laughs> it out of the room, I know. Yeah. So I, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more artistic because I, I could and I had a lot of creative freedom. Um, but I decided to go with a just a, a black and white logo, a logo that didn't was not made of multiple colors. So it's all one color. Um, yeah, there's, you can see like little bits and pieces um, of it there. Oh, it's on the banner. Yeah. So it's, it uses a lot of lines. It uses sort of a lot of abstract forms. Um, it has a lot of symmetry. Those are all things that I like. And I think those are all things that sort of go into a creative process, whether that be for photography or for design or what have you. Um, the other really big motivator for me is I wanted that logo to be able to sit on top of anything and sort of show what's going on underneath it. So that's why there's not a lot of solids going on. Um, and because I knew that F64 was going to be a photography based brand, um, I wanted to make sure that it was super versatile, that I could put it on top of images if I wanted to, that I could fill in those lines with images and patterns if I wanted to. Um, and there is no camera or lens in that logo, which I'm real <laughs> proud of. <laughs> there is, there is. So what, um, what are some do's and what are some don'ts when it comes to, to branding? Yeah. So I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it super basic because there's a lot of opinion on this. Um, but I think, the first and foremost thing that, that make up a really good brand is sort of the story. Um, so making it personal, whether that's personal to your product or personal to the origin story of the business. Um, a, a, sort of an example I like to give clients if, if they're like, I haven't even thought about this before. Like think about creating your mission statement for your business. There's going to be a lot of purpose in that. You're going to have to explain what your business is and why you're doing it. Um, so sort of putting that personal touch on the brand is important when you connect with people because ultimately that's what they're going to connect on is that purpose and that story. Um, and then the other part is identifying and empathizing with your target market. So if, even if you have a great origin story, even if you have a great brand design based off of that, um, 
if you don't have, if you don't know who you're speaking that story to, it's not going to resonate with everybody because you can't please everybody. Right. So when you identify who it is that you're trying to communicate to and who you're trying to sell to ultimately, um, that's going to drive sort of the implementation of the brand, the brand voice, you know, how you talk to people um, and that sort of thing. So have a, have a story uh, or a mission statement, have something to talk about why, what is your why? Um, and then making sure that you know who you're talking to, who you're telling. Yeah. So it seems that it's going to really help that you have the, you meaning the general customer that would come to your, or somebody looking to design a brand, at least understand their own business, understand what it is that, that they want, right? Like what is your elevator pitch? If somebody said, Hey, what do you do? Well, I take pictures of ducks in water. Like that's not, that's not going to impress anybody. Right. And so right. your logo therefore may not really come across with that. But if you were to say, Oh, you know, I'm a landscape and bird photographer, you know, that comes across quite a bit differently. And then automatically some logos start to pop into your mind. Right. Mm -hmm. some, some, some ideas that you can come up with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For me, and I'll, I'll just spot on my video really quick. Cause you just, this, came to mind was my logo <clears throat> and you didn't get to design this uh no i didn't one of your one of your instructors did from college actually <laughs> got to do that um for me it was very important that my voice in my business and you can tell me whether i've accomplished this or not is that i wanted a little bit of grunge in there i wanted a little bit of edginess a little bit of like that's not perfectly clean text Right. Mm -hmm. And my goal was, I hoped that, you know, clients would look at that and think, wow, this is going to be, this is going to be a little bit different. You know, <laughs> that's not yeah. been my hope. <laughs> no, but what's, what's cool about that is, you know, when, when you get a chance to talk to clients and kind of explain what imagery concepts is, by the time you talk to them, they've probably already seen your website and they've probably already seen your logo. And then when you get a chance to actually share that story and that reasoning, that's when everything starts to click. And that's when people are sort of sold on the idea for lack of a better phrase. Yeah. Here's another design that you did. And we don't know what kind of photographer this guy is, but I bet you can guess <laughs> by looking at the logo. And so this, this to me, this is a very clear, very clean logo. I, I like it. When you design something like this, do you have to consider what this stuff is going to look like when I say stuff, but when the logo or the branding or the graphics, what that's going to look like on, on other, other products, other outlets like t-shirts or web. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, so that logo in particular if you sort of look at my portfolio and all the other things that I've done or the other logos that I've made, that one has the most detail and it's one of the biggest. And I wouldn't like, I wouldn't do that style of logo for everybody, but for that particular client, um, I knew right from the beginning that they were going to use that logo only on a website and only on business cards. So that gave me a lot of space to kind of play and add some of the detail, like in the Sunray area and the mountain range. Um, but that was part of the conversation that I have with the client. Like, where is this logo going to be used? And in other cases, um, I actually just spoke with a client today where they want to do a new rebrand. And I asked them, I said, well, are, you know, where is this going to go? And they mentioned t-shirts. And when it comes to embroidery or screen printing, anything having to do with apparel, you are limited on colors in most cases, I would say. And so if I have a design that is overly intricate and is made up of 16 PMS colors or colors that are expensive and, and you know, treatments like that, and then the client goes to use it on something that I didn't ask or I didn't prepare for, um, that logo isn't going to work on that product. And one of the things that I learned in school that has really just stuck with me is, you know, a good logo can look amazing in color on a website. And then it also has to look really good, like on a cardboard box in black when right. something's being shipped. I'm going to give you a good example of what doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> my logo. Well, <laughs> now granted, this was designed a long time ago, and maybe maybe it's time for a rebranding. But you know, this we have struggled so much with how to put this on packages or brand this on a T-shirt or put this on something else. Where uh, when you did F sixty four. You know, it it was intentional. It was like this is this this logo, like you see down here in the lower right, like that will print on anything, right? We can mm -hmm. because it's it's a, technically it's one color. It'll print on anything. It's easy to convey. You see what it is right away. Um, but that, not so much. There's, there's even a bevel and emboss <laughs> on there. Like, uh oh, wait, hang on, hang on. That's I, <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. It, I know. We have we have more things to work on than redesigning dad. <laughs> so let's uh, let's hit a couple questions because we have a real serious one from Alicia, who says, uh, "What is your stance on key lines?" Big grin. <laughs> Be careful how you answer this. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Well. Turn the air off. Uh, oh, careful, careful. <laughs> um, so I'm assuming this means key lines in competition. Yeah, well, um, it, I mention it quite in, often. <laughs> because you like them? I like them. I think they help. I, I think they help when someone is considering the entire photograph and not just the key line. I have seen many a key line that are way too bright and are you know well if it's distracting then don't use it is sort right. of my rule so right. Right. i'm on, i'm on the gray area cuz i have to be cuz i need air conditioning yeah i think she's uh i think she's just give me a little dig which i appreciate <laughs> thank you for that i i love yeah, thank my you. family that's wonderful um we have a question from frederick <clears throat> what's the best way to find a good designer and do i need a do i need separate designers for my website email, printed materials, presentations, et cetera? Uh, great questions. Um, to, to find a good designer, I, I think word of mouth is, is the best way to go just because the internet is full, just full of designers. But if you really just want a, a clean, state, clean slate, um, looking at places like Dribble, um, it's D-R-I three B's L-E. Um, Dribble is a cool place to look at different designers' portfolios. Um, it's kind of a creative space where uh, people go and they, you know, comment on each other's stuff, but there's really high quality work on there and it's a good place to um, look at websites and that sort of thing. So definitely check out people's portfolios, but because the internet's so big, Dribble is sort of the first thing that comes to mind for more of a narrow scope of there. Um, Oh, or, or there, or there. I'm so subtle. <laughs> uh, there's no subtlety. We're all friends here. Okay. So. Um, the second part to that question, you know, whether or not you need a, a designer for all these different facets, I would say it totally depends on the designers you're talking to. So there are definitely people who specialize in digital design. That's all they do. And they're really good at it. And if you're comfortable hiring different people for different things, you're obviously going to get, you know, more quality in one particular area um, than you would if you were to hire somebody like myself, who kind of has their hands in everything. So um, it, it just depends on the person. So like I've had people come to me that want branding work and will also need business cards as well as a, um, a website designed. And I'm confident enough in the knowledge that I have and the experience I have to offer both. Um, and I have a portfolio that reflects that. So if you're checking out a designer that says, you know, oh, I can do it all, um, check their portfolio to see if, you know, the quality of work. Because again, someone may be really good at email marketing, but their logos kind of falter. And you're, you're going to get a little bit of that everywhere. But if you can manage a team and manage multiple people that all have separate roles and sort of, you know, pay those competitive hours for different people, um, then that's great. But a lot of my clients just kind of want one person 
to do everything. And I've spent a lot of time, um, you know, like print work. I spent three to four years just on print work, um, you know, and I'm going back into digital and so on and so forth. So resumes, portfolios, they're all super important. And just like asking a lot of questions too. Is yeah. Helpful. So I was going to ask what, what would be a, a handful of questions that somebody should ask their designer going in right off the bat? It, it, it honestly depends on the project. So, um, if like, let's just say you, you want to rebrand your business. Um, I think a good starting point is just asking the designer if they have any examples of rebrands that they've done because a rebrand is going to require, at least in my experience, certain steps, um, and certain capabilities that a designer should be able to answer right off the bat and sort of be able to preemptively ask you questions about. Right. As um, to a completely new brand, they've got to stay sort of true to the old brand a little bit when they do a rebrand. So it sounds like that might even be more work. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, if you just ask your designer, do you have experience in this thing that I want to do? Um, hopefully they're honest. And if they say yes, ask if you can see their work. Um, that's, I think that's a totally appropriate thing to do. Um, and then if they say no, um, you kind of have, and if they say no, but I'm, I'm willing to, you know, give it a try, you really have to evaluate like, okay, how much time and effort am I willing to put in and let this person sort of learn on my project? I've had some really gracious clients <laughs> that very early on in my career were like, hey, I need a logo. And I said, I've never done one, but I'd like to try. And my, <laughs> my sort of what I was charging, what their budget was, what the timing was, it all worked out. Um, but yeah, I would say broadly speaking, ask if they have experience in what you want. So first know what you want. Um, and then ask to see examples of their work. Got it. What, what would be the process that somebody should expect when they go to, uh, you know, a designer, you know, meaning we know that there's, that there should be some questions that are going to come in, but what about like redesigns and, you know, what if, what if somebody designed something and actually this prompted my thought, Peter asks, how do you handle a customer who hates your first drafts of design for that client? What is your process? Like how, what, what should a customer expect? And then how, what, what should they look at? I know it's different for more, you know, every designer is a little different, but. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, the, the goal of a first draft, I would say is to hit the mark in purpose, but maybe not in aesthetics because everybody's aesthetics are different. Right. Um, but hitting the mark on the purpose means that the designer has asked a, one, just a lot of questions about your company, who your market is. Um, so while you may not like the colors or the form, if they can present a first draft with reason, and sort of hit back on the key points um, to your previous conversations or to what you asked for and expected, um, then I would say, you know, that that designer still has iterations to do. And I think it's expected to not get it right on the first go. Um, I, I think sort of the revision process is a really good time for a client and a designer to sort of meld ideas and work together. Um, I sometimes have clients that are just like design me a thing and I'm going to like it regardless. And that's like, that's great. That's cool. That's easy. Um, but then, you know, then you get clients that I've had really long discussions with after they filled out my questionnaire and I'll send them a draft and they'll say like, oh, I don't really like flowers or I don't really like this thing. Um, but like, I get what you're doing. Like I get what you're trying to communicate. So to sort of answer the question of what's expected, um, you, you should be expected to answer a ton of questions because that's really design has to come from a place of research, I think. Um, so the designer should be doing a lot of research, not just on you and your opinions, but on your company and what you're expecting. How many designs do you initially provide for somebody to look at? Do you, do you feel comfortable you know, handing them one? Or should I, as a customer, expect three completely different designs in the beginning? Or is that different for each designer, how they work? I would say 
that it's different for each designer and how they work and their relationship to the client too. Um, I've worked with some clients who were very straightforward about what they wanted in a logo and like even down to the icons or, you know, the images that they wanted. And by the time that I was done iterating my first idea, because I knew that we were clear on what was expected, I felt know. comfortable. Yeah. yeah, I felt comfortable presenting that first design. Um, and that's kind of where it ended. In sort of in a general sense, most people that I work with, they're not designers, so they don't really know what they want. They know what they like, but they don't know how to express that. So I typically provide three to four options. Um, I find that anything more than four, like even five is kind of a lot and it's a lot to take in. Um, and the more options you give people is not always best. Right. And, and I think, you know, kind of going back to why design matters and branding for your business. I mean, this is really your voice. And so <clears throat> you really want to know who your client is. That's, that's really important. And I'm going to use a term that I don't fully understand, but somebody in the audience uh, is going to, is going to appreciate is the voice of the customer. And uh, Stephen Scharf and I have had many conversations and it's really sort of opened my mind to this idea that I, I, I not only just need to guess what my client needs, but I need to know what is their voice? What are they saying to me? And what, how do they perceive what I'm, what I'm expressing to them? And it's, it, to me, it seems that the design of a physical thing or the branding or the design of a virtual thing is part of meeting that voice. You know, my voice and their voice kind of coming together and being able to understand each other so that I can speak to my client. Because not mm -hmm. everybody, everybody's client's everybody's client, right? Right, right. Absolutely. And you know, that, that takes time and research into understanding who your client is in the first place, because you may think it's, it's one demographic of people and you try it and maybe it's a demographic you weren't expecting or the people you weren't expecting. Right. Right. Well, we have a couple questions just, just for the audience, the ever attendant audience. Uh, we have, we have about maybe 10 minutes to kind of wrap this up unless you guys have a bunch of questions and we'll, we can push it over. So let's jump to the two that we have now. So Kim Shapiro, we know Kim. Love you, Kim. Hi, Kim. Uh, have you had a client whose creative vision didn't mesh with yours? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Um, and that, that really just comes down to their understanding of sort of what a logo looks like. Like, um, I've had clients before that want like six different images in a logo that are, you know, not even an inch big on a business card. And I, I've had to go to them and say like, hey, this is what you told me in the applications that you want. And here's why what your vision isn't going to work from a professional standpoint. And I find that those conversations can be difficult because, you know, some people, they, they think they know what they want or they're really persistent on what they want. Um, but when you sort of go through that interview stage or me interviewing them about what they need, Right. Um, that that kind of gives me understanding of what it's actually going to be used for, and a lot of times clients don't think of that. So it's it's just a conversation. Right, right. Well, it's it's also it's it's just like you know what you do as a service industry very much like what I do for weddings. And when you when your client interviews you, you're actually interviewing the client to see is this a client of mine? Because let's be honest, I mean you could design something that is outside of maybe what your preferential design forte is but why would you do that why i mean you you have your set of type of clientele that want to come to you for your style just like as all of us photographers we have our own style so right maybe right. maybe there's that one which uh which which frederick asks you know how do you deal with difficult clients and bad ideas aka <laughs> peter <laughs> Oh, well, I can't I speak to that. <laughs> I'm not allowed to speak to that specific example. <laughs> um, no, but on, you know, when it comes to clients that are, you know, super opinionated or are very, like, seem to be very clear in what they want, my job is to kind of get an understanding as to why. 
and get them asking themselves why you know why do you need like four different types of flowers in your logo next to your text because <laughs> if, <laughs> if if they are really persistent on their idea then there's got to be a reason whether or not i think it's a good reason is another topic but there's got to be a reason and i would say most often when i start asking those hard questions those why questions um people start to reconsider their ideas surprisingly um and you know part of my job is to reach a middle ground between somebody's vision and what can physically like work and be put out into the world right. um so it's a uh, it's a long process though it can it can be a long process there's uh there's two videos and i'm not i'm not going to play them maybe I'll, I'll i'll link to them in the youtube description but there's the one about the the woman and and you can tell it better but she's a designer oh. she's got a client who wants that's not the right color pink you know i want the pink, like the sushi down this that yeah yeah and what's funny about that example is that was a printing example and what's so different, what I've learned that is so different between just graphic design and doing logos and stuff on the web is that printing has limitations. And the whole point of that video was that this woman wanted a, wanted a pink that felt a certain way. But when it comes to the actual like technical and mechanical process, like with printing, there are some things that you just can't do unless you have all the money in the world and all the experts to do it for you. So that was a great video though. That's stuff that you that you deal with and Peter deals with with the journals. Well, Peter deals it with it with all of his books basically. But you know, you have a certain paper stock, or whether it's you know got a spot coating, or it's you know whatever. Like, why isn't that green the green we want, or the? And that's yeah, that's physical limitations of the, the ink combinations as well. Yeah, and. A lot of it comes down to budget too, which on a consumer side is a real bummer. But if you want to use, you know, a very specific color, it's called a PMS color so that you get exactly what you want. Well, that can cost more. And, you know, what I've loved about learning print design and print production is as a designer, I can actually educate clients better on designs when it comes to their budget. Like, I know you want this specific color, but know that you're going to pay this extra price to get that swatch that you're looking at in your living room. Um, and that's, that's also a little challenging for photographers because, you know, if, for example, you, you're used to getting inkjet prints and you're working in an Adobe color space or wet process prints, and that's sRGB color space, when you start to get into the space that you're working in, and this is where hiring an expert to do your branding and design for you that that expert like what you're doing Kira, you know where this material is going to go from a photographer our giant scope of color going down to cmyk it's it's like you know it's like trying to fit a semi in your prius right it's not <laughs> you're just it's not gonna work <laughs> so no no and that's that's really hard for people to understand that you know one just don't understand the web or printing but two like they're just they just want to create stuff and then they just want it on a business card and they want it to look the same and you know it's a process <laughs> right right uh one of our last questions uh if you guys have more you can throw them in there we're getting close to the end but steven asks um he says would be interested in hearing what kira thinks are examples of great industrial design e.g products Ooh. Is there anything in the world that you that you like the design of or dislike the design of? I I have one for a thing I don't like the design okay. of, um, and it's it's very broad. <laughs> um, the the user experience and often also the user interfaces. So like websites, how you interact with websites with the government or state facilities, like. I don't know a person who has enjoyed their time at the DMV and that, that process is designed. Um, you know, websites, when you go to log in for your health insurance, that process is designed. And I have just experienced awful design that has taken me from department to department to department because I couldn't find the button that, you know, click here, you need to do this thing. Um, so that, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say across the board, most government systems and websites are just not well-designed. 
Right. Um, as far as something that I, I do like the design of, it feels very generic to say, but like all of Apple's stuff, it, it just feels so comfortably designed. Like I don't question any of it. And part of that is just, you know, my aesthetics and the way I like to work with things. Um, but, but yeah, like anything that Apple has designed, I say anything, but I mean like the stuff that I have. Um, I've, I've just been really impressed with the design because it just kind of feels normal. Minimalistic. Yeah. You're, you're kind of a minimalistic designer. What, what is, oh, um, uh, it just came to me. Oh, quip. So just so, just oh. so you guys, just so in the Miller household, anytime Kira and I open up a package, we, we are like, Hey, come here, look at this. This is beautiful. Right? Like we just got, uh, uh, Margie, we got her a subscription to this, uh, plant kit that comes every week. Like a gardening. Her. Yeah. And it's, the design is beautiful. We open the packages. So we're always talking about how much we like the logo or the voice that's in there, you know, yeah. and Kira, you love your toothbrush, right? <laughs> I do. That's a really good point. I do love my toothbrush. She does. Um, and, and, you know, one of, just to kind of tack onto that real quickly, um, I'm seeing a lot of companies sort of change the way that they design specifically their packaging to just be more eco-friendly and recyclable and using materials that um, are, you know, not going to be around for however much time past me using it. Um, for example, Quip, um, because they change your, they send you new brush heads for your toothbrush, like every couple months. And they used to come in these really thick plastic tubes. And like, the design is really good. The design was cool. But I always felt like, what am I supposed to do with this big hunk of plastic? <laughs> and I don't know how long they had been working on it for. But the last one I got was in really nice put together, sort of like a recycled cardboard packaging. And as a consumer, I feel better about sort of purchasing their product or, you know, using their product. And I was still impressed by the design, even though it wasn't. Impressive. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Frederick is asking, what is your desert island font? Ooh. And let well, me, that's a good one. Let me add to that. What font would you never want to enter your desert island? You know, the farther I've gone in design, the more bad fonts are sort of in that category, right alongside Comic Sans. Like that's that's sort of the you know the original bad font. The original um, bad font. <laughs> yeah, just all kinds of bad. Comic Sans. Um, my my desert island font. I mean, it changes constantly. It's kind of it's kind of feels a little boring, but I would say Open Sans. It's a, it's a, a free typeface. Honestly, it has, this is just me kind of geeking out, but it's got a ton of different font weights. So, you know, it can be like super thick and it can be super thin. Um, and it looks good on almost everything and it matches almost every typeface. So that would, that would be my go-to. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, thank you, Kira. Where? Where can all of your new friends find you if they wanted to hire you for a design job or they just want to follow you? Just, they just want to go to your website and just ogle at your beautiful designs. Uh, how would they find you? Yeah, so the best place to connect with me um, for design stuff is on my website, um, musedragon.com. Um, and I have a contact form there if you feel like filling that out um, to, you know, chat. But you know, Kira at musedragon.com is my email as well. So happy to chat through there. Um, but that's, that's where all my design stuff goes. So that's the best way to reach me. Right, right. And anything that, that gets emailed to f64live.com goes to her <laughs> as well. Just so you and, know. And any, anything that goes to the IEPPV uh, contact form also goes to me. <laughs> true that, true that. Yes, yes. So Again, thank you, Kira, for uh, putting up with all the questions and thank you for sharing all that amazing information. I know that this is a very deep and passionate um, topic for you and that it's, 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 it's kind of what you do. It's who you are and it's fun to, to sit and talk. So if you guys are ever hanging out with Kira, 
just ask her a design question and she just lights up and she'll talk about it forever. So <laughs> don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kira. Thank you. Good night.